Welcome to Precision Stuff. Today we're going to be talking about thermal nodal networks, also known as thermal circuits. Let's say you have a large complex system. You have a car, you have a uh, piece of consumer electronics, you have a rocket or some other vehicle or even like a house or a piece of external um, equipment. And you need to predict basically the temperature and the power of every single component in it. And you might have a thermal team and you might be able to do analysis on any one little joint and establish resistances and heat capacities. But how do you figure out how the whole system behaves, especially when things are you know, very complex, there's lots of components, there's lots of connections between your components. Maybe the resistances are nonlinear. It's some sort of you know, fluid correlation and you have you know, fluid properties and temperatures change and Prandtl nussle and you know, everything is coming together. You might have radiation, you might have pumps, you might have uh, coupling to environmental conditions, you might have uh, varying power boundary conditions when you know, computers or fans or motors or other heaters turn on, you might have chillers turning on, you might have uh, coupling to ambient, there could be you know, clouds or cold, you know, clear sky or uh, external wind. Like, how do you predict a complex thermal system? that has many, many components, something that you just can't easily solve with like a simple thing by hand. That's what we do here. So this is called thermal nodal models. And essentially what we do is we take our system, we break it down into individual components, and we invoke electrical circuit, basically linear algebra, to solve the problem. And the reason why we do that is there's a direct coupling between electrical circuits and thermal circuits. So in an electrical circuit, we might have delta V equals IR across a resistor. And that says, you know, change in voltage across the resistor is related to the current flowing through it and the resistance. And in a thermal circuit, we might say something very similar, which is the change in temperature across a resistance is the power times the thermal resistance, R theta. I'm going to be dropping the thetas for the rest of this, but just, you know, if you're talking to EEs, they want to see the theta because they don't understand thermal resistance. Um, similarly, uh, capacitors. If you have a electrical capacitor, you might have a capacitance times the change in voltage with time is equal to the current. You know, current flowing into the capacitor charges it up. Similarly, thermally, the total heat capacity of a node, delta temperature, delta time, equals power flowing into it. And this is conservation of power. This is conservation of charge. The, um, and the way we use this is we'll build out electrical circuit models and then just solve them. So let's say we have an arbitrarily complicated system. It could be hundreds of nodes, but let's just do this example for three nodes. So I have three nodes, my favorite three nodes, node number one, node number two, node number three. Each node has heat capacity. And that's C1, C2, and C3. Each node also has a thermal resistance to its neighbor. This is like a fully connected system. That's R12, R23, and R13. Then we can go even further. We can say, let's say node one is like a computer or a heater. And when it, you know, at certain times or certain temperatures, it will turn on and create heat. And we can add a current source call it P1, that appears from ground. And technically here, ground means absolute zero Kelvin. Like every node has capacitance to zero Kelvin, even though zero Kelvin is like nowhere in the system. And this is represents you know, power springing in from the ether, going from the electrical domain into the thermal domain. We can have a P2, and we can have a P3. So how do we figure out how the system evolves, you know, how things change, how they react? We start by writing the conservation of energy on a single node. So you may remember from like you know, chemistry or physics, like energy equals mc delta t. And this is mass, and this is specific heat capacity, which is like the um, heat capacity per material, c equals um, joules per kg kelvin. And then if you take mass times C, 
you know, MC equals big C, which is really just joules per Kelvin. It's kind of a weird unit, but it's going to be really important. Joules per Kelvin, how much energy you store per change in temperature. Big things take a lot of energy to move a little temperature. Small things, they move really fast. Let's take the derivative of this. So instead of having E equals C delta T, derivative of energy with time is power. Assuming the C doesn't change, which you know, truthfully it can, but we'll say C delta temperature delta time. Cool, so let's use this. That's conservation of energy on one node. Let's write it out in more detail. We say big C dt1 d time is equal to, well, power in minus power out. What is the power in? What is the power out? Well, I don't know what's happening in the rest of the circuit yet, but I know that P1 is showing up in node one. It might end up trickling out somewhere else later in life, but it's gotta show up here first. So I'm gonna say plus P1. But I also know that I'm connected to node two. Let's say that node two is hotter than node one. What would the power flow be? Well, you know, we'd have T2 over here, and there'd be a flow of power this way into T1. And that would be equal to plus T2 minus T1 over R12. And this is the, the delta between these two nodes drives power from one node to the other. So if T2 was hotter than T1, the power is positive, and therefore the temperature would rise. Eventually T1 would meet, meet T2. This delta goes to zero. They are now in equilibrium. No more power flows. Cool. We're also talking to T3. So we get a plus T3 minus T1 over R13. And that's actually the entire equation. I can say these are all the power flows into and out of the node equals the change in the temperature of the node. They could be balanced, they could be positive, they could be negative. Um, you might be asking, well, this looks like power in minus power out, but these all look like inputs. What's going on? Well, technically, T2 over R12 is a power in. Like, that node is sending this power this way. I just happen to also be sending a minus T1 over R12 back the other way, and it basically cancels out. So technically, there is a power in and a power out on every single connection, but we really end up just looking at what is the delta between these two that drives net power from one node to the other. Cool, so this tells me the story of a single node. If you give me the temperatures and the resistances and the powers and the heat capacity, I can tell you what the derivative of T1 is, but it doesn't capture the rest of the system. We can write the same equation for every single node, but then how do we, how do we predict what happens next? Well, we have to solve a system of equations. And this is exactly what linear algebra is for. So we have to basically turn this into a matrix and we can solve it simultaneously. So what we're gonna do is put this into boxes. We're gonna have a C matrix multiply by a derivative of temperature matrix. And that'll be equal to a power matrix plus a, this is where things get really fun, a one over R matrix times T matrix. And this one over R is the conduction matrix. And this is actually the meat and potatoes of the whole system. It tells you not only who is connected to what, but how well. You know, if you had no connection from one to three, that would show up in the R matrix. If you had a really strong connection from one to three, that would show up in the R matrix. And temperature is your state variable. Like this is where you started in life. C and R are you know, constitutive equations and connections, and P is your loads. And then what you can do, delta T, delta T, we get the inverse, C minus one times power matrix plus C inverse times the conduction matrix times the T matrix. And now I can solve at any time for the derivative. That's really powerful because then I can start running a uh, simulation solver and I can basically invoke, well, you know, T of the future is, you know, very similar, pretty darn close to T of the present plus some time step times delta T, delta T. And what I'm saying is if you tell me the initial conditions, 
and I can calculate the derivative and you give me a time step like one second, I can tell you what I think the future looks like one second from now. And it might not be right, but I'm pretty close, especially if your time step is really small and you can also start to use more advanced um, solvers. This is like just a standard Euler solver of I'm going to time step into the future and you know take my current state, look at my derivative, and then end up there. In the actual world, you might have some complex curvature to it that you might you know misestimate. But if your if your solver is really fast, or if you use a more complicated solver, you can solve for that. But what are all these matrices? Cool. The C matrix is just a bunch of heat capacities. We end up with C1, 0, 0, 0, C2, 0, 0, 0, C3. I'm going to write this out without all the inverses, times the derivative matrix, delta T1, delta T, delta T2, delta T, delta T3, delta time is equal to the power matrix. Well, that one's pretty easy. It's P1, P2, P3, plus the R matrix is really fun. We basically have to take all those equations that we had here in terms of, hey, what are the R's associated with all the T's and put it together. And what we find is, um, looking at that, we can say, we just start grouping terms and we'll find that we get a minus one over R12 minus one over R13. And then we get a plus one over R12. And then we get a plus one over R13. And this gets multiplied by T1, T2, T3. And so all I did is I took that equation on the previous sheet and I basically spread it out into one line and just group terms. If I now repeat for what these are going to be for the next two, what this is saying is, hey, temperature one times these resistances is powers leaving the node. And the other temperatures times these resistances are powers coming into the node. So when I move my frame of reference to node two, I better get something like this, a bunch of minus terms showing up. So if you write out all those equations, you'll come up with something that looks like this. You get a plus one over R12. Here you get a minus one over R12 um, minus one over R23. And then you get a plus one over R23. Similarly, um, whenever you're the center of the world, whenever you're the node in question, everything you're setting heat to the world, you get those negatives, and then the rest is positive. So by symmetry, minus one over R13, minus one over R23, plus one over R13, plus one over R23. And this is the full matrix right now. There's a lot of fun properties here. Um, these rows better add to zero, because basically everything that goes in goes out if all these temperatures were equal. If all the temperatures were the same, like one, one, and one, this better sum to zero because you'd be in equilibrium. Uh, at least on this part of the matrix, you could still have power generation. The next thing is the, it has to be symmetric across the diagonal because power that goes from T1, like power that comes from T3 to T1 is, should be equal and opposite to power coming from T1 to T3. Um, Imagine if you had more power leaving one node than getting left from it. You can basically, if this is not symmetrical, you can violate conservation of energy. You can have a situation where two nodes are at the same temperature, but one is sending heat to the other. Then it, that one will get hotter and then send that heat back and then it will get hotter again. And then in your simulation, your temperatures diverge and run to infinity because you are creating power from nothing because your um, conduction matrix is not conserved. Uh, there's a few weird cases where some of those rules get broken. Um, if you have just conductions, then you should have your row by row add to zero and some symmetry. Um, if you're simulating a fluid loop, you can get in a situation where you have a loop of resistances that all add to zero that aren't quite symmetrical, but still conserve energy, but that's um, more complicated. 
So if we solve this, what can we do? So now we can go back and basically at any point in time, you tell me the temperatures, you tell me how things are connected, you tell me the loads, I can then tell you the derivative and then we can figure out what happens next. How do we actually use this? So it actually takes a while to assemble this matrix to figure out what's connected to what. And you might have a ton of work that goes into every single resistance. Like let's say you have, you know, you have some you know, group of spheres and there, you know, there's water flowing over them. And then there's you know, a, a plate down here and it has power, all sorts of stuff. You might be doing detailed FEA or experiments or writing big um, equations and correlations to figure out what every single R in the system is. And you might actually have to update those R's. Like some of those R's, like maybe R12 is actually a function of um, you know, temperature T1. It could also be a function of temperature T2. Like maybe it's related to the fluid temperature and the surface temperature because it's some crazy boiling calculation. It could be a function of time. You know, you're switching it on and off. It could be a function of like, you know, like the phase of the moon, like crazy stuff. Um, and if you really wanted to, every single time step, you could recalculate your whole conduction matrix. It might be expensive computationally or maybe not that bad, but at every temperature and every time, you could go recalculate all of these and then feed forward. And that allows you to solve for you know, nonlinear problems, time varying problems, temperature varying problems. You could have fluid properties that change over huge orders of magnitude. You could have flow that goes from laminar to turbulent and you could capture all of that. And so you can have a ton of rich complexity in every single one of these resistances. You can even have that in your heat capacity as well. Like if you have a fluid, your heat capacity, your density, they're a function of um, temperature. You could have a, a tank filling up and the mass is changing over time. And therefore you can capture that as a, a change in heat capacity in time. So um, if you're running a simple, just like a circuit solver, where you just put in a bunch of capacities and like resistors, you could simulate some pretty simple linear things. But if you're actually writing out a nodal solver yourself, now all of a sudden all your R's, all your C's, all your powers can be time varying, temperature dependent, and very complicated. There's a few areas where this uh, breaks down, and one of them is radiation. If you have really simple radiation of like, you know, one body to a wall, you can calculate what the equivalent R is. It's nonlinear, it's temperature dependent, so what? You can, knowing the temperature, back out what an equivalent R would be. But once you have multiple bodies radiating to each other, you actually have to do a lot more work and you have to write um, equations that conserve radiosity which actually factors into the account that there's like reflections and you know, radiation from one surface might bounce off this one and go to that one. And there's some resources on that. If you want to learn more, there's a really good book, which is aptly named A Heat Transfer Textbook by Leanhart and Leanhart. And they have a really good description of radiative heat transfer and describing how you calculate this. Um, lovely textbook, it's cheap, it's available for free online as well. And it's like the best, most intelligent description of rated of heat transfer for gray bodies in circuits. And what you'd end up doing is you'd actually have all of this for your linear temperatures, and then you'd add in a whole bunch of like, I forget what it's called, but it's gonna be like a you know, radiosity matrix times a bunch of T to the fourths. So you're gonna have like T1 to the fourth, T2 to the fourth, T3 to the fourth. And that's if you really need to capture it properly. Many times you can, you can fake it with just gray body and um, a linear, like a, a linearization of radiation, but if you need to capture a reflection between multiple objects, you need to go a step further and add in this as well. Excellent. Thank you so much for listening to Precision Stuff. Have a great day. Please like and subscribe. Thank you.